I want to turn now to Ito. Uh, Ito, for the last hour and ha an hour and a half or so, we've heard a whole series of problems that have arisen, whether in the WTO, in global value chains, in the international trading system, in the international financial system. In many ways, Japan is caught in the middle in almost all of them, between the US and China, between the US and Korea, between Russia, China, and the United States. So I'd be interested in knowing how it feels to be squeezed like this and what the Japanese are planning to do about it. Let me just come back to macroeconomy, uh, which may be a very important aspect of the uh, issue we are discussing. And uh, probably a Japanese experience may provide some kind of uh, uh, implication for that. Now, because I'm an economist teaching at the university, I want to just uh, mention supply and demand. It's very important. And what came out in the beginning of this session, uh, in the previous session, mentioned uh, is a very serious problem of supply side. That is what uh, Larry Sabad called uh, secular stagnation, and what uh, Robert Gordon just discussed, the total factor productivity of the United States was very stagnant for the last 30 years. Now, if you have a very stagnant supply, you can't do anything. Well, you may be able to stimulate the economy by stimulating demand for a while, but what happened now is maybe stimulated too much. So it just stimulated too much, too, ma too many debt and very high price of the stock, and there may be more risk of just falling down. However, demand stimulation is very important when it is very stagnant. And that is what we experienced after the crisis of 2008. And Japanese experience was a typical case. As you probably know, we have a very bad situation, what we call deflationary trap. It was in trap. So we have to get out of the trap. And abenomics is very, very unorthodox. A ultra uh, expansionary policy combined with inflation target. And we found it was successful. So in order to just get out of the very serious lack of demand, you may need some kind of a very unorthodox method, and similarly did by EU and United States. Now, the problem we have, we were successful to change the trend. However, inflation rate is never going up to 2%, and the potential growth rate is in very low or 1%. So that just implies supply side is not catching up. So then that is just the next problem. So the, what happened now is we have abundant demand. So that was just contribution of the previous uh, the macroeconomic policies. But then what happened is whether we can just uh, prepare for sudden drop of demand. And unfortunately, there are many of the issues we can think of as a source of the disturbance in the next uh, couple of years. And we have already talked a lot about Trump's administration. So let me talk about uh, US-China to the relation. That is very serious for two countries. But from a macroeconomic viewpoint, it may be more serious because it can be a cause of the triggering of the dropping of demand. Uh, I have a lot of opportunity now talking to Japanese business people, what they are doing uh, responding to this kind of a trade conflict. And most of them mentioning shifting production location for one from China to other places. Because the most of the multinational companies, not only Japanese, American, European, just spreading the production location in many countries in order to just uh, prepare for the risk. So when the risk is more visible, it is very natural for the companies to just shifting production. And also I, I have asked the question whether you are going to make an increase in investment in China. And then, well, they are not very sure because they have to wait and see whether there is going to be an increasing risk or not. So if this kind of a trade conflict is just uh, changing the mindset of the industry, not only Japan, United States, Europe, and that can have a very important uh, implication for the world economy. It, it, it seems ironic that, um, maybe a little bit optimistic, but in as much as Japan seems to have 
if not solved, addressed its demand insufficiency problem. It's now facing very serious supply side problems. So it just goes to show that you can't win. But I think this, it highlights the fact that in an interdependent international economy, no one country can hope to address all of its economic problems without taking into account what's happening in the rest of the world.